So obviously we're weakening up here a little bit. Does this have anything to do with what Powell said? Like, what, what do you think is the main thing that we didn't know yeah. before? Well, in tandem, him, in addition to remarks from St. Louis Fed President James Bullard today, kind of putting a dampening effect on any sort of uh, expectation that we might get a 50 basis point cut in July. Still might get 25 basis points, but, you know, markets pricing in a pretty heavy chance that we would have seen 50 basis points in July 31st meeting. I think when you hear Jay Powell come out and say, you know, the economy is still doing pretty well but we are acknowledging that the risks have increased because of the trade issues, because of slowing global growth. Uh, you know, that seems to hint on the borderline that probably isn't dovish enough to warrant a 50 basis point cut. And then you have Bullard, who is a voting member of the FOMC, largely regarded as the most dovish member of the FOMC, saying, I don't see the case for a 50 basis point cut right now. That says, I mean, right out there, spelled out in Manila, this is not going to be happening. So uh, I think that if you are someone who is maybe expecting a 50 basis point cut, that is the reason why you're probably trading off right now. Uh, so aside from what they're going to do on rates, there's also a lot of interest these days on the politics that surround the Fed and uh, with President Trump, of course, chiming in all the time about uh, the Fed and Jay Powell. So uh, Powell actually stressed the Fed's independence when it comes to political pressures. Here he is earlier today. The Fed is insulated from short term political pressures, what is often referred to as our independence. <laughs> Congress chose to insulate the Fed this way because it had seen the damage that often arises when policy bends to short-term political interests. Central banks in major democracies around the world have similar independence. And that really wasn't all he had to say on it as well. I mean, no. it came up later. There was a, a question. question. And yeah. um, that, I mean, I feel like that... He, he was a little forceful there. Yeah, yeah he said uh, so that was in the prepared yep. remarks. So that was written out. But later on, there was a question from the crowd. And he said that, uh, you know, central banks across the world have experienced episodes where they haven't had full independence. And that's led to, quote, bad things happening. So bad things, I mean, <laughs> kind of weird language for the Fed chair to use. But he said that includes experiences here in the United States. So I want to delineate here. He's not saying that the Fed is facing the pressure right now. He's saying in the past the Fed has uh. experienced pressure, but obviously the reason why he's bringing it up right now is to hint that the Fed obviously under the looming cloud of the constant tweeting from the president facing the same sorts of pressure. So, you know, kind of reading in between the lines there. But look, as far as you know, covering the Fed. I've covered this for some time. This is about as spicy yeah. as you'll get from Jay Powell or from any Fed member for that matter. So, you know, we'll take what we can get. I mean, are the gloves coming off after dodging questions for so long? It's like, I, I don't, I don't want to talk right. about any political or uh, elected officials, not even in private. Well, to Brian's point, I mean, the gloves are not going to come off probably any more than this, right? They're and, like halfway. Know, Jay Powell is more of a, a golf glove guy than a boxing <laughs> glove guy. So it's not like it was that much of a protectant uh, to begin with. But I, I, I do think um, that the more he's asked about it and, and the more he has to talk about it and the more Trump talks about it and then the more it's speculated that, well, if Powell, do, like, the thing is, he, it, it's not really about him, right? It's not really about whether Jay Powell does or doesn't do what Trump says, right? So I was like, if Trump says, I want the Fed to do a certain thing and then independent of Trump saying that the Fed does a thing, enough people are going to connect the dots that then it sort of becomes that thing. And I think that's what has to be frustrating right now if you're Jay Powell. And that's what the market has been pricing in here. But I think you had Bullard come out today, like Brian mentioned, you had Powell's comments I took away. I think they wanted to, they bashed the bulls in the face. Look what happened. Look what has happened to this market since that Chicago conference and they turned a little more dovish. Stock prices have gone and through and hit a new record. Tech stocks are still on fire. And I think they're watching what the market says here. The market might be a little out of hand. What they have done now, in my opinion, uh, has shifted the ball back to President Trump at the G20. Can I just say, I am surprised. I think Jim Bullard would be quite pleased to hear this conversation, that it's so much mm -hmm. about him, because frankly, I think he's the most ignorable member of the Fed, because <laughs> for a long time, well, for a long time, he's been the most outlandish, right? Yeah. There was a time back in 2014, I remember covering Jim Bullard when he was out there advocating for rate hikes because the Fed had been very close mm -hmm. to meeting its goals. And then over the next two years, they hiked rates one time. So mm -hmm. I think he's always been a loud member or a loud Fed president. Right now, he's a voting member of the FOMC. So his words matter a little bit more. But I, I am surprised to see that the reaction the market had, because it did have one when he came out on the tape and said, I don't think we need to I cut mean, rates. And that's why I think his tone uh, just that's why it sparked the sell-off, I think. You're not used to hearing, I think, that type of commentary from him. No, see, I think you are. I think it's standard fair. But, but this on, raises the question, but, though, about everyone looking at the dot plots from mm -hmm. June and trying to figure out which were, the eight members, yes. which were the eight members that advocated for yep. rate cuts. One of those eight advocated for only one 25 basis point rate cut. The other seven advocated for two. And again, this is by the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. This is different than asking a policymaker, do you see a case for a 50 basis point cut 
right now. So Jim Bowen may have been someone that marked a 50 basis point cut by the end of 2019, but says that there's only a, a, you know, enough data to warrant a 25 basis point cut right now. But Kashkari, on the other hand, who is not a voting member, so he did not dissent against the decision mm -hmm. uh, in June, but he had the Medium post, uh, a blog post last week right. saying, I advocated for a 50 basis point cut uh, in uh, the June meeting. So you have a lot of varying kind of degrees here. And I think as more Fed speakers come out, yep. you're going to see more people try to draw the connections between who was what dot. And I, and I would say, if you look at, you know, kind of the end of Powell's speech where he spoke directly about future policy considerations, um, he said, we're also mindful monetary policy should not overreact to any individual data point or short term swing in sentiment, mm -hmm. basically saying we are not going to cut rates by 50 basis points just to kind of see what happens. And isn't that good news? Doesn't that mean that they're not they're kind of that falling apart? No, that's, 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 that's how did that go much smoke? 50 basis that's points. That's what's cuts. good. Yeah, when I used to cover the Fed way, way back in the yeah. day, 50 basis <laughs> points, the world is ending. The, Unemployment's going to hit, what, 9%? This is crazy. This yeah, is I mean, crazy I think it's talk. like, okay, we'll do the, even if for a bowler, like 25, it it's fine. Yeah. Let's yeah. see what happens. To me, it makes it seem like it's not as bad as we talk about all the time. I think it means they're not going to be experimental. Right, they're, they're not, not going to play around they don't need with to be conventional bold. wisdom on Fed. Thing. I think and one I, thing that's worth pointing out really quickly, though, is that Powell interestingly made a nod to the markets today. He did not do that in the press conference on June nineteenth. He was asked about kind of what types of financial uh, signals the markets are telling him right now. He said that at times markets can be prescient about financial risk. Mm -hmm. That's the quote that he used. But he said then he had a full a whole another set of sentences right after that where he yeah. said that you know at other times the markets can be a little bit too excessive, a little too mm -hmm. exuberant to bring back the Greenspan like language yeah. for those who remember. But um, I think that hints at the idea that Powell does kind of see, and he didn't say this directly, but indirectly sees the Fed funds, futures, contracts, markets, and where equities right now as not pricing in the actual reflection of what the Fed sees in terms of the economic risks on the downside. And I wonder if the Trump administration had played their hand differently. Maybe 50 basis points would be more on the table because the more you try and job on them, maybe they can't make well, that Trump move. Off. He because, wants yeah, no, that, I'm saying like <laughs> then you just you can't right. be seen as being more aggressive than usual. You have to just go by the drip drip playbook. Well, then just leave the G20 with no, nothing, nothing confirmed yeah. and just accomplishing nothing. They don't get a 50 basis point base point cut and a 15 percent correction in the markets. Ooh, calling it right now. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Timestamp. Exciting week next week.